Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jenna. This is Zach, Anna, and Deborah. And we're from Dort University. We're a worship team there. Um, and we are just so excited to be here with you this morning um, and spend some time worshiping. So would you stand and receive this call to worship? Um, I think the scripture will be on the next slide. It's from Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8. So let's actually just read that together to get started. It says, yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope, hope comes, comes from, from him. him. Truly, he, he is, is my rock and my, and my salvation. salvation. He, he is my fortress. fortress. I will I not be shaken. shaken. My, my salvation and my honor depend on God. God. He, he is, is my mighty rock, rock my refuge. refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are our rock and our salvation, our stronghold. We can depend on you. Jesus, you are better than life. Your love is better than our life. And so we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning. And we can take all of, of who we are and hold it as an offering to who you are, God. So hear our words, our melodies, our songs, the thoughts in our hearts, God, and let that be a sweet offering to you this morning. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. Amen.
Jesus, we just thank you. We love you. Lord, I just ask that you can touch our hearts as we listen to this message. Lord, I just thank you that you are a firm foundation that we can build our lives on. may be seated. Can I teach you a fun cheer? Okay, awesome. This is, uh, this is called the ESPN cheer. And do you know what sound that, that makes to get the notification on your phone? No, 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 no. No one likes ESPN. So, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate our friends at Dort. We're going to say, hey, Dort, go, Dort. And we're going to go, no, no, no. Okay? Okay, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try it once. Then we're going to join. They're not listening right now, so they can't hear it. And then the third time, we're going to do it together. But the third time, we're going to stand up and do it, okay? And then I'll tell you why we do it. Okay, so I'm going to try it. This is how it's going to go. Hey, Dort, go Dort. No, no, no. Okay, now we're going to try it together, but we've got to be quiet so they don't hear us. Hey, Dort, go Dort. No, no, no. Okay, everybody stand up. Okay. Hey, guys, we have something special for you, so listen. All right, are we ready? Hey, Dort, go Dort. No, no, no. All right, sit down. Hey, the reason why it's fun to celebrate people, uh, Romans 12.10 says, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. So it's part of our duty as the body of Christ to build up brothers and sisters. So thank you so much for leading us, guys. Hey, I'm going to pray as well. We're going to ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, we come and give you thanks on this beautiful, 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 blustery morning. Uh, Lord, your, your provision, whether it be in the wind and the rain and the snow, is a reminder that you are in control over everything. Uh, Lord, may we lay our lives into the hands of the one who is capable of caring for us. Lord, I pray that you would take what you've given us this morning and would you turn it uh, up in our lives so, Lord, that our lives might be to the tune of lives of praise to you. Lord, my prayer is... That from those sitting in the seats, Lord, let this week be the way to kickstart something that will happen that will change the, the whole fabric of Northwest Iowa. Maybe a group of students who are on fire for Jesus, who have heard and believed the message of the gospel, who put their faith and their hope and their trust in Jesus, who alone is sufficient enough to save us. Lord, I pray that they lay everything aside so they can meet you. Lord, I believe that they're just waiting to be asked. And we pray this in your name. Amen. When I was 16, I was convinced I was going to do three things. I was going to play in the NFL, and I'm pretty much the epitome of male fitness. So good luck ever aspiring to this. I thought I was going to marry my high school girlfriend, and I thought I was going to be filthy, stinking rich, and all God's people said... Amen. Okay, here's what I want to let you know. You may not know this, but I did not play in the NFL. Big shock to some of you, I'm sure. I did not marry my high school sweetheart. And I'm not a millionaire. I'm a billionaire. <laughs> I lied. I'm not either of those things. You know, if you would have asked me uh, over 16 years ago, I'm in my 30s now, uh, I would have told you that those three things, I think, were everything that I ever wanted. Um, and you want to know what the scary part was? I believed that every single one of them was going to happen. You know, I was pretty sure that if I did all the right things in kind of all the right ways, that if I kept my mind positive, and if I was a good boyfriend, and if I was just stronger and faster and smarter than everybody else, that kind of all of these things would just fall into my lap. I remember thinking, like, I'll, I'll be on top of the world if I could just have these things. If I was good enough to lead my team to a state championship, or if I was just fast enough to be put on somebody's radar, that I could kind of escape. I grew up in western Kansas, which is a lot like northwest Iowa. 
I thought, man, this is my path out of here. And one of these days, I won't be driving, you know, my Ford F-150 to school. I'll be driving a, a McLaren. I don't know. You know, I had these dreams and, you know, these kind of aspirations. And I think when I was 16, I thought, I, I needed all of those things. I was convinced also that if there was a God and he did exist and that if he did love me, he would probably give me those things. And what I've learned almost 20 years later, though, is that was not the plan at all. You know, that wasn't the thing that God had kind of positioned for my life. And, you know, I spent a few of those years trying to figure out if there was a different plan. If, like, I had missed the cue at some point or if there's something that happened that kind of derailed my hopes and kind of aspirations. You know, maybe I was, on a, I was on the wrong timetable, I was born in the wrong year, I wasn't born to the right family, or maybe I just needed to wait a little bit longer to get some of those things. Or maybe if I could just try a little bit harder, spend a little more time in the gym, get better grades, you know, find a better looking girlfriend, there's all sorts of different things that would have crossed my mind at that time. Um, I, I don't know when it happened, um, I just remember that it did happen. The moment when I realized that everything God had waiting for me, it wasn't a plan. It wasn't some weird, obscure timetable, you know, that he had arranged at some kind of a, you know, arbitrary date in the future. But I, I think the moment I realized that what God had waiting for me that would fulfill kind of my deepest needs and, and longings was, it was not a plan, it was not a timetable, but it was a person, and this person's name is Jesus. And I think the more that I've, over the last 12 years or so, that I've kind of immersed myself in Scripture and I've been leading, a, you know, churches faithfully, you know, I think more and more, like, this was God's very plan since the beginning, that, that everything that Brandon Morrow was supposed to do since he was a little, little boy, everything I was supposed to become, everything that I was going to grow up to be was all through Jesus and by Jesus and because of Jesus and now for the sake of Jesus. And I think what I found at the core of what I'm really looking for is Jesus. I'm, I, I find this on a regular basis, that somehow I, I stray just slightly, and I, and I have to come back and I realize that kind of my, my hope, my want, and my desire, still at the very core of who I am, is, is for Jesus. So this morning, I, I want to do something, and I want to take us back to the book of Colossians, where we were yesterday. And what we're going to be talking about is how Jesus is that plan for your life. Um, there will be some of you who had very similar plans that I did when I was 16. You'll play professional sports, you'll marry your high school girlfriend, and you'll be filthy, stinking rich, and you'll buy whole one day, just to own it because you can. And what I wanna give you is I wanna give you a bigger picture. <clears throat> I wanna give you a more redemptive vision for your life because what I've found is that following Jesus has been the wildest thing I could have ever imagined. Um, we were living in Spirit Lake uh, like just like over 15 months ago. And several months before this, my wife said, I will never move to the state of California. And several months after that, we packed up our entire family, our three boys and our dogs, and we drove across the country to start a new life. That was never what I had planned for my life. At one point, I thought I was going to go to the University of Nebraska and be a dentist. That was after I realized that I wasn't tall enough or fast enough or athletic enough to play in the NFL. I'm not a dentist. But what I mean by this is just my life is just full of exciting adventures. Um, this year, I'll have a chance to go to the Congo and work with uh, a, a community in, in need of doctors and teachers and professors. I'm neither of those things. I'm none of those things, but I can pray for them. And, and you know, I would have never thought that like on my itinerary over the course of a year would be that I'm going to go serve people and serve church leaders and serve the church globally across the world. I would never have thought that, you know, I would have a, a, a California driver's license. I'm a kid who grew up in western Kansas. I grew up in a town of less than 1,800 people. But following Jesus has been, the most, has been the biggest, most redemptive picture of my life. And what I want to give you is I, I want to give you that because I think that's good for you. I think it's helpful for you. I think it's the biggest picture of what you need for your future. But as we open the book of Colossians, sometimes I, I struggle with opening this book in general. 
because I come to this book with my own set of convictions. I, I, I come with my own agenda, my own plan, because I don't want Jesus to meet my greatest wants and needs. There's a, still a part of me that's at work where I kind of want what I want, how I want it, and when I want it. So when I open this book, I often come not ready to meet a person, but I come with my own plan and agenda. Sometimes I have an agenda that I'll find what I want when I'm looking through these pages rather than what God wants. I think of it like treasure hunting. How many of you have been to a beach? How many of you have been outside of the state of Iowa? Praise be. Okay. How many of you have seen an ocean? How many of you know what sand is? Awesome. So how many of you in your mind could picture uh, on a beach looking for treasure with a metal detector? That would be awesome. So here, here's what I think of. I think of sometimes when I approach the scriptures as if I have my own agenda, that I am out on a beach and I am treasure hunting. That if I just look in the right places at the right time, that I'll find exactly the thing that I'm looking for. And it'll beep, 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 beep. And it'll light up. And I'll, it'll be revealed to me that everything I've wanted, everything I've needed, everything that I've been hoping for myself will be affirmed in these pages. And to be fair, I don't think we do this just when we read the Bible. I think we do this kind of day in and day out of life. We, we, we look for some kind of affirmation to put the seal of approval on the thing that we think that we want, how we want it, and when we want it. I find that even though that I, you know, I've, got a, I've got a doctorate in preaching, I've got a lot of education kind of theologically, I've been leading churches for well over a decade, and I find myself still hunting on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm still looking for truth in a world that's full of lies. I still want to make sense of the world. I still want to know that I belong somewhere in God's great and big plan. I think one of my biggest struggles is that I desire to be noticed. I have this, I have this waning desire that I'm still waiting to get rid of. I'm asking the Lord to free me from, that I still want to be liked. I like to be liked. Sometimes I really want to know that people value and appreciate me. But I found that if I keep looking for these things, it's probably because that there's some kind of unmet desire deep down inside of me. For whatever reason, some of these things just don't seem to go away. You know, by worldly standards, I've got a lot to brag about. I'm, I feel very, very fortunate. I, I live in a nice house. I've got three boys. I'm married to the woman of my dreams. I've got two dogs. Their names are Bill and Bruce. And everyone should have a dog with a human name. If you don't have a dog named Kevin, go home and rename your dog. And yet, I still find that I'm looking for something. You know, some days I, I can't quite put my finger on what it is exactly. It's kind of this unrest inside of me. You know, maybe it's joy, some kind of happiness, something measurable. Maybe it's adventure. Maybe it's excitement. Maybe I'm just looking for belonging, affirmation, somebody to tell me that they're proud of me. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably like twice your age, but, but some days I recognize that what feels like this big hole in my life is that I just want something to fill it with. I think this is probably true of you too. I think if you'll just be honest for a second. You're probably looking for meaning. You're trying to figure out your place in the world. You know, you want comfort. You still want to be cared for. You're, you're, you're needing hope in a world that feels hopeless. You've got girlfriends. You've got boyfriends. You play sports. Um, if you go to Western, you're probably a good athlete. Can I get an amen? None of you are good athletes. Okay. That's not what I heard when I was in Spirit Lake. There's a little thing that goes on about what happens at Western. You're, you're probably all good athletes. Am I right? Wow. Just one kid in the front row is a good athlete. Awesome. Are you smart at least? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's pretend. You might be athletic. You might be really smart. You might be well known in your churches. You might be really funny. You might be really artistic. You might be really liked. Or on the inverse of this, you might be really lonely. You might be one of those students who doesn't identify with hardly anything that I just said, and you might be looking for a moment to kind of break out, and you're looking for your, 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 your clean future, away from Western, away from Hull, away from Northwest Iowa. You might have everything going for you. You may have nothing. 
Um, but what I said to you yesterday is I'm committed to telling you the truth. And I'm committed to making much of Jesus. And I want to tell you the truth that I'm not sure that any of those things matter. How funny, how artistic, how smart, how athletic you are. Your teachers can't hear this because I've prayed against it. They might disagree with me, but your GPA does not determine your future. It won't be your ACT score. You know, no one has ever asked me what I got in the ACT. No one has ever asked me what my high school GPA was. It's not a normal adult conversation, by the way. Hey, what's up? My name is Brandon. What was your high school GPA? It was a one point. No, nah, it wasn't. Um, your teachers won't like that. You may not like what I'm about to say. You probably won't be a professional athlete. A couple of you will go play in college. You'll play probably at an NAI, D2, maybe D1 if you're lucky level. And you'll come back and you'll have a great job in the future. You'll go to a school that you desperately love and you want to support for the rest of your life and you'll raise a family in the future. Who you're dating right now is not going to like this next statement. You probably won't get married to each other in the future. I know you know that one person in your community who met their significant other in kindergarten and you kind of hope that for your little boyfriend and girlfriend and you text each other, I hope we make it like this in the future. What I mean by this is that whatever you're looking for, you know, it's dating, it's sports, social media, sex, alcohol, is probably just the attempt at what you're actually looking for. I think we all share some of these same characteristics that we all want something, we all have a desire for something. And when, when, I, when I use the word desire, I want you to think of it in kind of a biblical way. That I want you to think of desire as a longing of your heart. You know, these are, these are desires of the heart, that I, that I want to be loved, I want to be heard, I want to be known, I want to be valued, I want to be accepted. I want somebody to feel proud of me. I want to, worth be, I want to be worth being apologized to. You know, I think these are what you could call core desires. These are kind of at the base of all of us. And there's other things, you know, what you call outlying desires. Like, you, you might be tired, you might be hungry, you might be bored to death. You might just want to leave school and go hang out with your friends. You might want to go home and play Madden or Fortnite or whatever other game that you like. I would say that desires are good things, though. These were given to us by God. He created us as desirous beings. But, but I think the problem with desires is that we don't always know where to aim them. And, you know, desire is something that we aim. It's a, it's, a, it's a longing for our heart. We don't know what to do with these desires. We either give too much to them or we give too little. And most of the time, I think our desires are misplaced. These are misaimed. We are firing in all the wrong directions. And I think you guys already know this, if you've grown up in the church, if you've been at Western at any, any time, like the easiest thing to do is just to blame everything on the pattern of sin that is covering humanity. You know, we'd just be fine if sin and Adam uh, hadn't messed everything up, and they're the reason why we can't have nice things. <laughs> you, know, you know, here's how I know that we haven't aimed our desires in the right direction. Because if you do have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you've probably taken them as the desire that is greater than your desire to be loved by Jesus. You know, you've probably taken to wanting to hear the cheers of crowds at sporting events rather than hearing the Father's words that he is pleased with you and that you are well loved. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time in the time that I'm with you this week, but I do want to take us back to uh, Colossians, and we're going to look at Colossians 2, where Paul is going to help us turn our desires towards Jesus. I want to read to you Colossians 2, verses 1 through 2. Paul says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Here's the short, here's the Brandon Morrow revised version. You can't find those Bibles in stores yet. Uh, but here's the point that I think Paul wants to get across. He says, I know we don't know each other all that well, but I've been working my butt off to encourage your heart. And in the New Testament, the heart is the place of desires. It's the seat, not kind of the heart that beats, but it's kind of the core of who we are. 
And it might be a tad bit discouraging to hear that all the thing that we spend too much time on, you know, it's dating or sports or TikTok or friendships that hurt us that, they, that weren't actually worth spending that much time and energy on. And so Paul says, I just want to encourage your heart. I want to reorient this place of desire that exists within you. So he says, let's give the heart, the place where your desire actually comes from, let's give it something to look forward to. If that's not the thing that will fulfill you, if that's not the thing that's meant to fill that gaping hole inside of you where you kind of, you don't know where to aim it, you don't know what to look for, then Paul says, let me encourage your heart. Paul wants to encourage and unite us. He wants to bring us together. And the reason why he wants to do this is to give us what he calls the riches of complete understanding. I like that line. It sounds mysterious, like I've got, I'm, I'm about to beat the final boss on my video game, but I've just leveled up and I've got the riches of complete understanding. So I want to go back to you with this idea of treasure hunting. And imagine this, I want you to all close your eyes, sit up straight, close your eyes, and imagine that we've all got metal detectors. And we're scouring a giant beach. And just in the distance, somebody shouts to us, And this time it's Paul. And Paul says, you won't find anything on that beach. Come over here because I've got something better for you. Okay, open your eyes. The real treasure, Paul says, is not what we're looking for. He says the real treasure is knowing Jesus. The real hunt we're on, the hunt that we're we're actually on in our lives. And the thing that that sidetracks us off of our main mission is that we're looking for Jesus. And, And this is Paul's whole purpose for writing this letter. He wants them to know Jesus, that Jesus is God's plan for the world, the thing that we've all been looking for. And and I love this phrase that Paul uses. He calls Paul, or Paul calls Jesus the mystery of God. I like the mystery of God. Because it's this idea that it's like something that's been hiding. But now it's been revealed. It's come out into the light. You know, when the treasure that you've been looking for is right in front of you, you do not look anywhere else. When the treasure that you are looking for is right in front of you, you do not look anywhere else. You don't take your desires, what you think your heart really wants, and you point it somewhere else. No, all of your attention, all of who you are is focused on the thing that's right in front of you, when it's really what you need. Now, there are wrong places to look. There are wrong places to point your desires. There are wrong things to to be looking for. Maybe you might be looking for approval from your peers, from your friends, from your classmates. You might be looking for awards in sports or something to do with this school. It's not even getting good grades and getting into the college that your parents want you to go to. It's not about who you take to prom or whatever dance that you do here. Do you guys dance here? A little bit. All right. What Paul wants to communicate is that the real treasure is Jesus. It's none of these things. I love what it says in verse 3 that these are where all the treasures of the world, all the treasures of the world are hidden. And Paul kind of quotes it a little differently. He, He says that with Jesus, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are somehow available to us. And I like that little phrase, like wisdom and knowledge. And, and it's almost used as, as if it's a way to say, you know, if there's ever anything that you've ever wanted to know about God and his plan for your life, then you'll look at Jesus. And that's where all wisdom and all knowledge exists is with him. So if you don't know your place in the world, what do you do? You look at Jesus. Jesus. If you don't know your value or you doubt that you have any, what do you do? You look at Jesus. Because when you look at Jesus, here's what I think you'll find. I think you'll find a friend if you're lonely. I think you'll find purpose if you're feeling insignificant. I think you'll find joy when there are other things that will promise you fleeting glimpses of momentary satisfaction. Look, all of these things are being promised somewhere else, but they can't deliver in the same way that Jesus can. This is just statistical knowledge, like social media, for example. According to statistics, it's just going to make you more lonely. Sports, music, theater, 4-H, whatever it is that you do, poor substitutes for the thing that God has uniquely designed you for. It might be one of those things, I don't know. 
But like I said earlier, Paul's whole purpose is to make sure that they know Jesus. And in verse 4, Paul's concern for these people is because he doesn't want them to be deceived. You need to hear that Jesus is enough for your desires, what your heart needs, otherwise you will end up believing a lie. Now in Colossians, these lies are called fine-sounding arguments. And they sound too good to be true. They always overpromise and they underdeliver. And like, don't you hate that? Like when somebody says that they're going to do something and they don't? I hate that. I absolutely hate that. But I think that's precisely what Paul means. And I think this is where I see this happening the most. You know, with desires that want to promise something that they can't. And I know where you hear these. I know where you hear these desires that if they'll just be met, you'll finally be okay. You'll finally have everything you need. You'll finally have everything you want. I know you hear it at home. You will hear it at school. TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. You'll hear and see stories from other people. It could be athletes, celebrities, influencers, other kids at school. And you'll think, man, I wish I could have that. That would be nice. And it's not about the followers that they have. It's not the person they're dating. It's not about what they wear, their car, the things that they have. I, I live with this reality day in and day out. I've got a nine-year-old son. He's, his name is Elijah. He's the coolest kid in the history of the world. But Elijah has the biggest fear on missing out. It's called FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, <laughs> recently, it, 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 this sounds stupid, but Elijah is like the most emotional human being that's ever existed. Sometimes we just need to ask Elijah, Elijah, have you had a good cry lately? I think we'd all be better if we had a good cry. Can I get an amen? Amen. Awesome. Elijah, he, he was upset recently because he, uh, he, he got to pick what he wanted to eat for dinner. Quick question. If you got to pick what you got to eat for dinner, what would you pick? Chicken fettuccine Alfredo, who's next? Pizza. That's the only answer in the kingdom of God, friends. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus broke the pizza and passed it to his friends. If that's not your next communion at church, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Elijah, he got to pick up what he wanted for dinner, um, but the neighborhood kid across the street uh, came over and he asked him that dreaded question. Do you want to come to our house to eat? We're having pizza. And my son Elijah thought he was going to miss out on having this pizza that we eat all the time. And we eat pizza. We eat pizza like three times a week because we're Christians. <laughs> and good Christians will eat pizza. Amen? Amen? Yeah, if you don't like pizza, we're praying for you right now. So Elijah was a little bummed. I said, no, Elijah, um, I doubt that they actually planned for you for dinner. So you got to come home. you got to stay at our house and eat. Uh, and Elijah, you know, he had like two or three plates full of whatever his favorite meal was. I forget what we were having. I said, hey, man, uh, what would you rather have eaten? Would you rather have eaten this or would you rather have eaten pizza? He goes, oh, this is so much better than pizza. Look, I get it. Like, a new iPhone. Some of you probably got newer cars, you know, a nice new pickup to drive to school. You're concerned about what other people say about you on Snapchat. You know, you just you dream about that state championship or that big tournament that you'll win because you hit that final shot. Those are great. Those are awesome. Those are really wonderful things. But when you do get those things, when you have those things, what I find is you always find yourself wanting more. You know, like every year a new iPhone comes out. Someone will show up in a better car, and in my community there are kids who drive Range Rovers. Every child in my community drives a better car than me. You know, there, there's always another person to impress on social media. Look, there's always somebody who's more athletic, who scores more points, who's got more wins under their belt. And, and at some point, you just gotta, you gotta make a decision. You gotta go, like, when do I stop this? So Paul ends our, our passage with the desire that he has for this church. He says he wants to see how firm their faith is in Christ. A firm faith is when your desires are centered on Jesus. When you believe that Jesus is enough for everything you need. Okay, 
I'm almost done, but I want to do something before our time is up today. Can I challenge you to something? And I won't, I won't do it unless we have buy-in. Can I challenge you to something? Yeah. Right, w- just one more time. I just need a, a little louder so I can hear. I'm, uh, I was in the Civil War, so I can't hear very, mu- very well. Um, c- can I challenge you to something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think that was universal agreement. I didn't hear anybody over there, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll trust that because of, because of the cannons going off, I lost hearing in that ear. Guys, that was a long time ago. I wasn't there, I promise. <laughs> I, I want you to try something, and I, and I want you to see if I'm wrong. I, just, just indulge me on this. I want you to take from now until April 1st. And that's not very long. It's just the day after Easter. That's like Monday. And I want you to fast from something that's been meeting a desire that you have. I just want you to indulge. Like, I can't babysit you, but I triple dog dare you. And I've never been able to turn down a triple dog dare. So I triple dog dare you to do this. I I, I want you to stop whatever your your Snapchat streak is. I want you to delete the TikTok app. I want you to go like four days without talking to your boyfriend or girlfriend. Because here's what I think is going to be true. Your Snapchat will be there when you get back. TikTok, unless it disappears from the internet, will still be in existence. And I bet you whoever you're dating will still like you. And if they don't, it's time to break up. (laughs) And, and, And when you find yourself wishing you could open up your phone or that app and, and send a text message or, or be with that other person. Just my invitation is don't. Don't do that. Use it as an opportunity to say, my desire is for you, Jesus. This is when you read scripture and you listen to worship music and you talk with your parents and you spend time with maybe other believers. And, and what I know about this is it's so hard because some of you probably just even the thought of that gives you like mildly crippling anxiety. But I think what you'll get, and this is what I want you to try, and this is my challenge to you, is that when Jesus is what your heart is looking for and your heart gets it, I promise you something in you will change as a result. What if I told you that just several days from now your life could be massively different? What if even it wasn't time with Jesus? What if I just said, like, look, No more Snapchats, no more TikTok, no more texting your girlfriend. Can you do it for four days? And at the end of the four days, I'll give you a million dollars. How many of you could do it? How many of you, it would be hard? Look, I I think there's something far greater than a million dollars at stake. I think it's your future. I think it's your identity. I think it's your purpose. I I think it's who God has made you to be. And I think the greatest version of you is about four days away from finding intimacy in life with Jesus. And I don't think I'm wrong, but I want you to try me on it. Look, you don't have anything to lose. It's less than a week. It's less than a week of time. But I think what you'll find when you meet with Jesus will be far greater than everything that you gave up. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we come and give you thanks. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your unwavering love to sinners in need of grace like us. Lord, that I pray that we take this challenge uh, seriously, <clears throat> to fast, to lay something aside. I hope, uh, Lord, our first instinct is to take out our phones and to get rid of it, because I think that what we'll find is you at the very center at the very center of our wants, at the very center of our needs, at the very center of our desires. And and Lord, I'm praying and trusting that you'll meet us, that what you'll do as you meet these students over the next three or four days, that you will call them to their God-given futures. You will remind them of their purpose, of their identity. Lord, I pray that as a result, it would encourage and embolden the faith of this community. 
Lord, in the faith of whatever towns they live in, whatever churches they belong to, whatever families, Lord, and whatever homes that they call home. I pray that we would see a renewal by the power of the Holy Spirit, of a hunger and a desire to be with you, Lord Jesus. I pray we'll take you seriously and we'll seek you earnestly. Lord, may you find us. May you show us that whatever we're looking for, Lord, that you are ready and willing to satisfy. You have it all, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, let's stand. Let's continue to worship. So this next song that we're going to sing is called Firm Foundation. Um, and it's a favorite over at Doors. I've heard that you guys enjoy singing it too. But more than that, we actually chose to sing this song because I think it goes really well with what you guys have to say. Um, if we're honest, we all have this emptiness in our hearts. Um, and we try to fill it with all these things. We want to be loved. Those are good things, but hey, when that becomes the foundation that we build our lives on, it's going to crumble because the rain is going to come and the wind is going to blow and that foundation that you build your life on, it's going to crumble. It's going to be like sinking sand. But do you want to know the foundation that's not going to crumble? And that foundation is Christ. He's the rock on which we stand. His foundation is strong. His grip is sure on you and he's for you. He's enough. He's enough to fill that ache and that longing that you're going to have. He's enough and he's for you. So we're going to sing this next song. And hey, if singing isn't really your thing, that's okay. Say the words in your head. Pray them. Think about them. Because they're meaningful. They mean something. So let's let this become our anthem today. So we're going to sing. Um, and let's just declare these words together. Still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't be going under. I'm not held by my strength, cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. Stay for it. 
and just be come before you just grateful grateful that we know that you're the God who fills every need every longing every desire that we have in our hearts God we were created to be loved by you and your love for us spills into creation and you look at us and you call us yours your children So thank you, God, that that is the promise and the truth that we can stand on. And that truth isn't going to go away. It's not going to shake or crumble. It isn't going to sink when the rain comes. Our lives can be full of chaos. They can be shaking. But Jesus, you are firm and your grip on us is sure. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these words and these truths that we can sing. We pray that we carry them out as we go with us today, God. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in your name, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. You guys are good to go to class, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.